Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where he's in the art and science of games. I am, of course, Josh Bicer. We have another great cast for you this week. We're going to be talking to one of the two developers behind the indie adventure game, The Dream Machine. And point-and-click adventure game made entirely using handmade assets and stop motion that basically was developed over seven-plus years in combined with its multiple episodes. And this is one that we tried to get a cast going about a year or so ago, but then craziness ensued and we kind of lost touch, but we finally got him on. So please welcome to the cast from Cockroach Incorporated, Anders Gustafsson. And I'm pretty sure I just screwed up your last name there. No, it was perfect, Josh. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. No problem, Anders. It's great to have you on. It, like I said, we've been trying to talk you know, for the last year or so, and we finally were able to tie everybody down for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, happy we made it happen, finally. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the Dream Machine, this was one of those games that I didn't start to pl- I think I got a contact from your publisher, one of the people. I think it was right around... I think it was like the fifth or sixth chapter. So yeah. that was when I got to first see it. And then, of course, I played through the first four or five at that point as well. And definitely an interesting game. And for long-time fans of Game Wisdom, you know that I always love like unique or interesting aesthetics. And the Dream Machine definitely has that with yeah. the handcrafted feel of it or the handcrafted design. Yeah, it stands out a little bit. Mm-hmm. It sure does. But... There is certainly a lot to talk about here with the game being developed for seven plus years, especially what you guys are working on next. And for the people listening to us right now, as a heads up, we will be discussing spoilers later on in the cast. And I'll put up like a big old honking alert when we get there. But to begin with, Anders, since this is your first time on the cast, for people listening to us, can you talk a little bit about kind of your background when it comes to game development? And of course, what is the Dream Machine? Sure. Uh, my background is, I started out doing animation, mostly hand-drawn animation. Uh, I started out with doing television uh, shows for kids. Um, and then I moved over to advertising. Uh, I worked, worked in the advertising industry for a while for uh, both Nike and Adidas. Uh, and then uh, the, the kind of gaming bug uh, bit me. And I resigned and started doing small game projects of my own. Uh, Most of them were flat out uh, unsuccessful and I never even completed them. Um, uh, Which uh, it was very disheartening uh, because I I resigned and I was trying to do this. And after a while I, I realized that uh, I was trying to do too many things at once. I was, I was trying to do, the, the graphics and the sound and the puzzles and, and the story and everything when I should actually pare it down and just focus on one aspect. And, and that's uh, how I kind of started uh, getting on top of things. And, and that's how I made the first game, which is called, uh, which is called Gateway. We can talk more about that uh, a little bit later. Mm-hmm. And the, the Dream Machine is, um, is a game I made with my good friend, and colleague uh, Eric Salim, who's uh, uh, who's the genius behind the the, the, the play design uh, models uh, in the game, um, and it's a game that starts out in a very uh, uh, down to earth situation. You you basically move in into a new apartment with your girlfriend. And when, uh, as you're getting settled in, you realize that there's strange things going on in the apartment complex you just moved into. Uh, that's that's uh, the, I don't want to say anything more uh, before we get into spoiler territory, but but uh, that's how the game starts out, and then it gets super tricky down the line. But yeah, that's basically what the Dream Machine is. With development of the Dream Machine again, like you guys have been with the series being out was about seven years, but you of course worked on it for a lot for longer than that. Like when did like development first start on it? Probably 2007. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a crazy project. Like there's no other way to describe it, but, uh, I, it started out as a, 
as a little uh, side project that I was doing in my spare time. And uh, both uh, Eric and, 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 and me, we were not happy with our work situation. Uh, and in, at the end of, of a work day, we would call each other up and, and say, you know, how, how's, how's it going? And a lot of those conversations ended up veering into, uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be fun if we were to do this together? And, and we would just uh, spitball uh, ideas. And uh, uh, one uh, w- one time I mentioned that I was actually working actively on on a little game idea on the side, and he and he wanted to do something uh, hand built, excuse me, mm-hmm. hand built with clay and cardboard, and he he sent me um, a, a, which I, I thought was a crazy suggestion considering how much time that takes. So uh, in order to, to to prove me wrong and prove prove that it actually could be done fairly quickly, um, he sat up an entire night and did three little mock up environments, um, the full the full clay treatment, <laughs> painted and everything, uh, and he, you know uh, he, he had to work so fast to in order to get all all this uh, done. Mm-hmm that uh I, you could clearly see fingerprints in the paint where where he he had touched the model before the paint had gone dry and uh to to me uh, i was so blown away by his single minded effort to convince me and but also the the this the, this grimy aesthetic that you get when you can clearly see the free fingerprints in the in the in the, in the, in the graphical asset so I was completely uh, won over and blown away, and there was actually no turning back uh, after that point. We just simply had to make it. <laughs> nice, yeah. And, yeah, like and like that handmade aesthetic definitely is one of the unique selling points of the Dream yeah. Machine. Yeah. So you're saying that the original, like what he did to like show things all to you, it, it took him what three days? You said or one day? One one night. One, one cr- night. One crazy night. Wow! It's the uh, the sets he built. They're not super elaborate. It's uh, mm-hmm. a wall and a floor basically. But uh, he he sure he he sure put in a, a huge amount of effort and love into those environments. Just just in order to show you know mm. uh, this is what you can achieve if if, if you just uh, hunker down and and, and do the do the job. Mm. And with like for people listening to us who didn't play the Dream Machine, that yeah. the animation that's all considered stop motion for like how the characters move and behave. Oh, it's it's a mix. It's oh. uh, we we utilize basically every animation technique uh, under the sun. It's three D animation. It's uh, stop motion, traditional stop motion, and um, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's we we utilize everything. Depend. Okay, it's very case dependent, but. The character, the main character is 3D animated because he has to move through so many lighting mm-hmm. conditions. So it's, it's, if we animated him with one, uh, under one lighting condition and then, you know, uh, somewhere down the line found out that, ah, oh, that's actually not going to work, then we'd have to redo that whole animation sequence. And we didn't want to do that. So we, we kept him, uh, as a 3D model. But, uh, Eric, uh, of course, he modeled him in clay and painted him, and then we just took uh, a, 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 bun- a ton of pictures from every direction uh, and used utilized that to turn him into a three D model. And I gotta ask, like, in terms of like the overall design of the game, again, with it taking over ten years or a little bit around there to get that game to get the Dream Machine completed. How yeah. long did it, like take you guys like in terms of like some of the more elaborate like environments to design? Uh that's a good question. I, I think yeah, some of them certainly took quite a while. Uh but yeah, you know we don't we we obviously we we asked to we are two confused Swedes, so we don't we don't uh, we weren't making this game on a huge budget. So we, we couldn't really afford to to scrap an environment and start over, um, we we did that once or twice, uh, but it was really the the exception. So we had to 
we had to roll with uh, what what we had. Um, so it was a lot of pre-planning involved, and it was a lot of uh, happenstance uh, mm-hmm. where we, we we kind of if we made a mistake, we'd kind of have to to turn that into an opportunity uh, in, instead of going back and redoing the whole thing. So that that was an, uh, a fun give and take by the by the medium we chose. And like it just sounds like amazing because I'm. Again, it's been over a year since I last played through the final chapter of it, but yeah. I'm remembering some of like the more like insane areas, especially yeah. when, again, like for people listening, I guess minor spoiler, we go into dreams in this game. So yes. there's a lot of surreal imagery in the dream yeah. machine. So like at that level, like especially like, near like the back half of the game, like I think starting from like chapter four, chapter three. Like that was still all done like handmade in terms of those environments, or was there some CGI or computer generated stuff for those? Uh, mostly, it's a it's a mix. We we try to we try to use uh, which which we, we try to keep it pure as as far as we, as far as we, as we could. But um, Eric only had an a small IKEA desktop to work on so uh whenever we needed an environment with a lot of depth where you could actually see far into the into the screen that had to be uh uh, digitally uh, a a set a set set extension basically Mm -hmm. but everything you see at the very forefront that that's all built and then we uh, we extend the set with uh, with cg in a very few occasions, but the, the the forest in chapter five comes to mind, and uh, the, the trippy uh, f- f- uh, apartment floating in uh, some kind of weird void in chapter four. That that's the void is obviously done yeah. uh, in CG. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, before we talk a little bit more about the dream machine, there is one thing that I wanted to ask you about, Anders. Just yeah. again, like with the fact that. You, uh, where you're based out of like for people listening uh, where are you guys located uh, I'm located in the very southern tip of Sweden Sweden's uh, roughly has the shape of shape and size of California uh, so I would be in uh, the San Diego equivalent of California and Eric would be uh, maybe not as high as San Francisco but a little bit shy of that and the reason why I ask is one of the questions I always like to ask developers when we are kind of talking to international guests is kind of like for people listening, how is like the game dev scene in Sweden right now? It's great, especially down here where I am. Uh, there's a lot of companies uh, establishing themselves in this actual city. Mm-hmm. Uh, IO, the company doing Hitman, has just moved here. And uh, yeah. Uh, an avalanche who did the uh, Mad Max game and um, oh, what's the name of those games? Uh, Just, Just Cause. Cause, yeah. Just Cause, yeah. They just opened an office here, and um, we have Paradox here as well. I, I, uh, though no game of theirs comes to mind. <laughs> Sorry, Paradox people. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a it's a booming scene, a gaming scene down here, and we have uh, about forty minutes from. From my flat, uh, you have the city of Copenhagen, which is mm-hmm. uh, the cap- uh, capital of Denmark, uh, which is also a, a huge gaming hub. So you kind of get two 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 uh, gaming um, cities for the price of one if you if you if you go here. Great, and yeah, it's always fascinating. Again, with you guys working on the Dream Machine for so many years, I mean, yeah. game industry has. For people listening, like we always say, like the game industry moves so much faster compared to other industries these days. That yeah, you know, like five, six years is like ten to fifteen years somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I, I, I love comic books, but um, and I, I, I try to go to comic book stores uh, as often as I can, but I'm, I'm always a little bit dismayed by how little, little happens. You, you go there every other year, and it's this. There's still comic books on the shelf. You have the Watchmen, you have Sandman. Um, uh, so, so I, and I'm not saying that nothing happens within the realm of comic books, but damn, computer games uh, uh, operate at a much faster pace. Yeah, like for myself, I don't have the money to invest in another hobby like that. Like, 
I can't spend five, ten dollars for a comic book. I, yeah. I have enough trouble, you know, just fine spending that on video games these days with so many yeah. of them coming out. <laughs> yeah, it it's an expo- expensive hobby for sure. Mm-hmm. Not not as expensive as as um, being uh, interested in cameras or anything like that. That's an expensive hobby, but but uh yeah it, it it's a it's a t- mostly it's a time sink it, it it drains money but mostly it's time it it really just drains time from you mm-hmm. um, in the best possible way of course <laughs> I, I love i love playing games i love games but... <laughs> and um you mentioned a few minutes ago Anders, that you worked on a game previously to the dream machine yeah uh what was the name of that one again it's called gateway, gateway. And what was the design of that one? Like, what was like the gameplay of it? Uh, it's uh, it's basically an an adventure game, but it's more puzzle focused okay. than uh, sto- It doesn't have a huge uh, author imposed narrative. So you don't walk around talking to characters. It's mostly enter a room, solve a puzzle, okay. move on. So it's a very simple game okay. that way. And I guess. For both you and Eric, like obviously the Dream Machine is an adventure game. Have you guys thought about this? May even be a, a, a spoiler for later on the cast. So, have you guys ever thought about like another genre, or I guess what has kept you guys focused on adventure game design and puzzle design? That's 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 a good question. I uh, I think it's uh, both Eric and I are uh, uh, have a, a strong interest in. The narrative aspects of, of the medium. Uh, what what type of stories can we tell meaningfully within the the realm of computer games? And uh, if you want uh, if you want to tell stories, can, uh, adventure games is a pretty good fit because they don't have a lot of uh, t- the timing p- puzzles. You c- the, they expect the the player to explore at his or her leisure, and uh, you can. Um, you, you can weave a lot of the story into the environments because uh, the player spends a lot of time just looking at these uh, at the backdrops. So you, can, you can hide a lot of clues and, and embedded, embedded storytelling with them in them, as opposed to a, a, f- a more fast-paced shooting type game where where you don't really get to uh, smell the the flowers and that's the, in the same way. And I think one that's kind of interesting, again, with the Dream Machine originally starting development back in 2007, you guys kind of got to be, like, in the front lines of kind of, like, the rise and fall of, like, the adventure game genre. Because, like, yeah. during, like, that decade, like, for people listening to us who don't remember, like, there was a time when adventure gaming was pretty much dead. The era, of course, you know, the golden age of LucasArts, uh, what was it, uh, Gabriel Knight, and those kinds of games have, you know, yes. all went away. Yeah. And I guess for you guys, again, like, 2007, that was kind of like either right around where it already began. Like, what did you think about kind of like, again, like that fall and rise of the genre? Uh, I, I guess uh, the, the death of the of the adventure game genre has been uh, tied to Grim, the the commercial failure of Grim Fandango, I guess, which came out in 1998. So when we started making this game, I guess the the, the genre had been uh, quote unquote dead for for quite a while. But uh, I've always loved the adventure games and. Uh, the fact that people consider the genre dead never really bothered me. Uh, it if if you you kind if if you build it, they will come. Was uh, some uh, our motto when we started making this game. But it's uh, if if you do something, you uh, we I mean we 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 don't since we asked two people making this game. Um, we don't have to make. Uh, it, it's it's nice if people buy it, and if if uh, a lot of people buy it, obviously that that's that helps us out. But it's not like we have outside investors or um, a, a board of directors who 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 wants to see a quick quick profit on 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 their investment. So um, it didn't really bother us that the genre was considered dead. 
And one thing that is kind of like weird that we can talk about now since when we first started talking about doing this cast last year is, of course, the sadly fall of Telltale. Because yeah. Telltale was kind of like it. Like they were developers who are probably most famous for bringing back the adventure genre. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I, uh, I credit uh, Amanita Design, who made the Samurast games and the Machinarium games. They, they, they was always uh, been ambassadors of the genre. Yeah. Uh, alongside the the, the broke uh, the guys who did Broken Sword. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I'm not uh, I'm not well read on what's happened to Telltale. I I'm, I was as shocked as yeah. as anybody when when they um, went belly up. But I'm 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 gonna assume that yeah, management is to blame because the games were pretty uh, pretty pretty impressive uh, right up until the end. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like again, like they kind of became the standard, or at least in terms of the mainstream market, of what people thought of the adventure game genre. Now, yeah. for fans, I, there have been many independent adventure games released over this past decade, even beyond that. Um, one of my favorites is from Wadget Eye. Have you ever heard of that studio? Yeah, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah, yeah. I played uh, a lot of their games. They're also great. Mm-hmm. They're they're more uh, purists, mm-hmm. as opposed to Telltale, who who um, uh, made adventure games a little bit more um, accessible f- for the for a mainstream audience. Uh, Tell uh, Wadget Eye uh, is is. Uh, they're going back to the to, to the old school where, mm-hmm. with the inventory puzzles and oh, inventory yes. combination puzzles <laughs> and and all all that good stuff which, which I love and uh, yeah I was really blown away by their latest game uh, what's the name of that this Unavowed I think Unavowed yes yeah yes. I really enjoy that one too that's great mm-hmm. has a, a great pace a great uh, sense of rhythm to it yeah and I guess another question I have for you is regarding like like this kind of like gameplay what are like besides adventure games do you play other any other genres or anything else that interests you sure i'm i'm a bit of an omnivore i, I try to play as, as much as possible um late uh, i think that the latest game i was i got really into was the return of the Ogre din oh, yes. and yeah that's it's a great game i i, I want to see more games made uh i want to see more people take the framework of of that uh, detective slow detective type game, mm-hmm. and and run with it. Uh, yeah. I want to play more of that style of game. And then I played uh, Cultist Simulator. Oh yes, I play that one here. Oh, you play that? Oh, yeah. it's a great game. Oh yeah, it is hard. Like that's a game I keep uh, going between loving and hating <laughs> a few yeah. times. It's a harsh mistress <laughs> for sure. Mm-hmm. But failing is, a, is 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 part of the fun. <laughs> I, I, I yeah I I don't want to. It's a game I uh, I don't want to look up uh, wikis or walkthroughs or anything like that. I, I because I I'm so fascinated by the sense of possibility that that game ga- gives me that I don't want to see a list of this is what you can achieve within the framework of the game because that would just limit limit my appreciation for it. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, one game I'm sure you must have heard of this one, Anders. Um, Her story was one of the ones I really enjoy when it first came out. Yeah, yeah, it's a great game. You know, like again, like we've seen, especially in, in including the Dreamers G in here, we've seen a lot of developers kind of experiment and move things around the adventure game genre this past decade. Yeah, yeah. My my definition of it, adventure games is pretty inclusive. I I I, I consider. The portal to be an adventure game even though it's a <laughs> first person yeah. pu- puzzle game but once they include characters and a narrative i, I think uh, that slides the thing over into adventure games i guess that's an interesting question for you Anders, regarding like the adventure game genre being the puzzle genre because yeah. we've seen some adventure games Again, like really focus on the story and the narrative. Again, Wadget Eye, Dream Machine, Her Story, etc. But I've also played adventure games that are more that are just entirely focused more on the puzzle side, and maybe the lore or the story is kind of like second or third. Um, yeah. Two games that come to my mind would be the Talos Principle by Crow Team. 
Oh, yeah. And um, there's a series that's on mobile that they also put a PC called The Room. That's like kind of like you're stuck in a room with like a crazy over elaborate puzzle and you have to solve it. And I guess for you, like games, like those kinds of titles are more puzzle centric. Yeah. Would you consider them to be part of the adventure genre or would they be more, pu- or would they just be kind of just a puzzle game? Uh, the Room, I'd consider a puzzle game. The Talos Principle is an interesting case because it, it's kind of, it's sitting on two seats. Yeah. But chiefly, uh, I'd call it a puzzle game. But obviously, there's a lot more going on uh, if you scratch the surface. But um, s- since you t- since you don't uh, have to engage with a narrative aspect or read any of those uh, the the computer log the email logs, um, I think that that's that's kind of uh, extending the universe of the game. So it's chiefly a puzzle game with a with a little soft adventure game uh, nougat <laughs> core. <laughs> and talking about games like the Talos Principle and even stuff like we've seen, one of my, another one of my favorites, The Swapper. Is oh, that, yeah. Like, there's a lot more in terms of, like, action or kind of like a... I'm not sure how I would put this. Kind of like we've seen stuff like puzzle platformers, like games that have, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, Portal being like more of a first-person control game, but still heavily influenced by adventure and puzzle game design. Yeah. And I guess for you, Anders, like, do you have a preference for, again, like as you said earlier, like the old school or kind of like, you know, like the traditional form of adventure gameplay, you know, like the LucasArts, Watchet Eyes, or do you enjoy like more like that kind of real-time control with stuff like the Swapper, Talos Principle, etc.? Yeah. Uh- I, f- I think the the the, the real time uh, is is a is a great benefit. Uh, I think one of the problems with adventure games today is uh, that that as as a player you feel quite detached from the action. You 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 click on one side of the room, and then you have to watch uh, walking animation for a, a second or two, and then you have and then you get to click again. Um, and I, f- I think that's a that's a bit of a problem. Traversal in adventure games is often quite boring especially if the, if you have to walk several screens length of of distance uh, so i think if we can get around that problem make uh, traversal sexier uh, <laughs> that that's going to be a huge benefit to the honor of adventure game and i think portal and uh, talus uh, are, are really doing that mm-hmm. yeah and i think that's actually a really good segue into talking a little bit more about like generally about adventure game and puzzle game design and then yep. we'll kind of integrate the dream machine in as kind of like the final part of that conversation sure. but again like as you're well aware of and i'm sure as well as everyone listening is well aware of the adventure game genre has been around for quite a long time when it comes to the game industry yes and we have certainly seen many, many different takes on not only just the general gameplay loop of adventure design, but also on puzzle philosophy as well. Again, um, uh, one of the guests I had on was uh, Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick, the, the original developers of like Maniac Mansion. They were kind of like at the heights of the LucasArts, and yeah. they did the game Thimbleweed Park, which is basically a love letter to that uh, to the LucasArts style there. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And again, like we can even go as far back as Mist, that game that I don't like. To be honest with you, Anders, I'm not even sure like how that game has like held up in terms of like I guess fame or renown. I know some people who've hated Mist and some people who've loved that genre or loved that series. Yeah, Mist is an interesting case. Uh, I uh, I fall on the love uh, portion of the audience. But it's it certainly has a lot of problems, uh, especially some of the labyrinth puzzles. Are yeah. uh, they weren't yes, straight up weren't fun at all to to, to solve. Um, mm-hmm. But I think what they did was uh, uh, with a with a um, technical limitation of using hypercards, uh, they imbued that game with a lot of atmosphere and and. Um, and style and, and that that helps a long way and with kind of like the growth of the adventure genre like that 
we've seen so many different takes on that kind of puzzle design. So I wanted to ask you a few questions about your thoughts on that. Because as we've said, there's many different ways of designing an adventure game these days. So I guess we've already kind of talked about the uh, traversal portion of it, but that's always been a killer for me. I'm sure for you as well, like when you have to slowly move from one area to the next. One of my favorites is when you have like those super wide environments, you have to wait for that character to just like slowly walk over <laughs> before the screen will transition. Then you get to like a very zoomed in one. Yeah. And I guess like, what are some of like, I guess this will be an easy or quote unquote easy question. What are some of like your favorite aspects of adventure game design? And what are some that you feel developers could improve on or even try to go in a different direction? Well, a, a very concrete answer uh, for things to improve on is to increase the walking speed of the character. I, I, I just see yes. so so many adventure games where uh, they uh, where the developer has uh, a greatly uh, inflated uh, take on, on 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 the patience of the player because the character is moving so slowly over across the screen and that you know that that's that's bearable for the first screen but then you you start imagining oh I, i'm gonna play a game at this pace no thanks and then you quit the game at, at the second screen and and uh, uh, i'm certainly guilty of that uh myself uh the first the first uh, demo of, of the Dream Machine, the character moved yes, so slowly across the screen. And uh, now I think uh, with all the updates, I think he, wor- he walks three times as fast as he did in the beginning. And that's uh, still never fast enough for some reason. Never fast <laughs> enough, no. Some, some people want to double-click to immediately go to where they want to go. But um that also hinders exploration a little bit because then you don't uh, stop and smell the roses and and you mi- end up missing a lot of uh, little objects in in the room. So you, I uh, I'm a little bit opposed to doing the double click to zip to where you want to go as well. But yeah, traversal is is I think is the is a big challenge if uh, if uh, adventure game developers just increase the walking speed of their main characters. I think uh, adventure games would have a much more broad uh, appeal. Mm-hmm. And uh, speaking about adventure games there, I guess one thing that I definitely want to ask you about, again, especially considering the Dream Machine's development, is kind of the rise of the story choices or morality systems or however you want to call them. That, again, yeah. like Telltale kind of popularized. Or we can yeah. go further back as like Bioware. With uh, Knights of the Old Republic, Mass Effect, and those kinds of games. And this has been like one of those things that, for fans of game wisdom listening to us right now, they know that I'm not a fan of these kinds of things. Like the first time when Tell do that, you know, they will remember it tag. It was like, oh, that's amazing. And then you realize none of it actually matters for the story. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, great. And now it's yeah. become like a meme every time that pops up. <laughs> uh, in, in these kinds of games. So I guess to frame that in a question for you, when it comes to the player actually in affecting the story of an adventure game, like what are your thoughts on that? Like, Do you think that is something that can work or do you think that may be causing more trouble than it's worth in terms of design? Uh, I, f- I think it absolutely can work. Uh, you'd have to... Uh, I mean, it, it obviously, it's a very tricky problem to solve because uh, you 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 don't want to write a game design document that just uh, by four uh, a million times, and then you end up writing a million versions of the same story, of which the player will only experience, ever experience one, because then you then you work at a one to a million uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, asset ratio, which which is which would be insane. Uh, but I, f- I think if if you take, uh, I, f- I think it, it would it, it could work 
Uh, I, I'm usually more impressed with when a when a game is very granular that, that it remembers the little things I did and 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 doesn't change the 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 spine of the story, but it acknowledges that we, we noticed that you actually did this. You 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 lifted that <laughs> cup of coffee over there, uh, and and it, uh, if it acknowledges. A, a minor thing I did, I usually end up being more impressed by that than if the game uh, bifurcates and, and goes down the. Uh, now I'm a now I'm a, an evil guy because I slapped a kid in the in the playground, uh, or now I'm a good guy because I chose not to do that. Uh, I, I don't really like those binary options. It's kind of insulting. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of them either. Again, it's like for people who listen, they know I'm not a huge like Bioware fan. Like I just found those systems to be just very gamey. You know, yeah, you know, one go in a room, punch somebody, negative three morale points. Yeah, then you walk yeah. over here, give somebody a money plus five morale points. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it it's uh, it, yeah, it it it's odd. Um. I am. I am. I'm. I'm not a huge fan of those. Well, I guess. I guess you. You kind of have to uh, in an MMO RPG, but I, I'm not a fan of of, of the numbers. Uh, exposing the numbers, what's going on behind the screen, that always takes me out of the experience, and I realize that I'm playing a game, um, which, which I'm not super uh, super big fan. Of. Mm-hmm. And it's always tough because. As you mentioned earlier in the cast, like playing games such as like the Paradox Interactive titles, those are games that heavily require you to know what's going on behind the scenes and understand the numbers at play. Yeah. And those games, like even for, like for myself, like I can't figure them out. Like I, I never grew up playing them, so trying to learn them without a tutorial is just an exercise in frustration for me. Yeah. But there's always that give and take between how much you really show the player what's going on. Because as you said, like for a narrative or more like that kind of organic gameplay, you don't want numbers popping up all over the place. You don't want to like overwhelm the player along those lines. No, no, it 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 it, it would be uh, very weird to to watch a movie where 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 these little text messages showed up on screen that <laughs> Kate will remember. <laughs> Bob being yeah. an asshole. I mean, it, that would just that would just take you right right out of the, of the experience. Mm-hmm. There's so many uh, so many uh, things game developers take for granted that that normal people that are super super confusing and weird to normal people. That it's I think the <laughs> the, the best way to play play test your game is to is uh, is to think would my would my 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 mother or my grandmother get this? And uh, if if uh, it hinges on her knowing what that plus five above the character's head means, then you should probably find a different way to solve that. <laughs> I'm glad that you mentioned that because that takes me to a really funny question. I always like to ask when we talk about adventure game design. Yep. Have there been like any adventure games, or even just specifically, we uh, drill down to puzzles that just drove you crazy, that you just cannot solve no matter what? It was just like you were never going to figure this out one out without having to look it up. Yeah, uh, that's that's a, that's a big topic. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, obviously the the cat mustache from Gabriel Knight Three comes comes to mind, but that it's. We, yeah, we do. We don't have to beat that Ted horse anymore. <laughs> but it's a horrible puzzle. Uh, if if anybody doesn't know, uh, you have you have to look like a guy who doesn't have a mustache. Uh, but the 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 solution to the puzzle is to draw a, a mustache on his on his ID card with a crayon, and then. Uh, Good old adventure game luck, oh, right there. Oh my God, it's yeah, it uh, it that that's also a reason why adventure games died because uh, for some reason, I think somebody made 
an, an analysis of why people play adventure games and came up with, well, uh, it's because they have these obtuse, wacky moon logic solutions. So that's what people appeals to people. Mm. But, but it, that's obviously not the case. It, uh, it, it's not fun to solve puzzles where um, you just have to try every inventory object with every in, uh, object in the screen in order to solve the puzzle. Yep. And that was kind of like like the standard strategy for so many of those adventure games. Yeah. And yeah, it's called, they call it key chaining. It's yeah. like you have key chain and you try every key on the lock mm. because until you come up with until something happens and, and you know that that's not a, that's not a, an appealing game and bonus points if the developer purposely puts in items that you can pick up that will never be used in the game yeah. just to blow up that keychain even more yeah and also uh, another way to easily uh artificially inflate the difficulty you know of an adventure game is to put the the item on the opposite side of the of the world oh. to where you actually need to use it so you so you have plenty of time to forget you ever picked it up before you actually have to use it and that's also that that's not good it's not fun it's not uh, mm. it, it it yes it's an artificial way to make the game harder yeah and i mean i think that's a good segue to talking more about puzzle design which we could probably spend an entire cast just talking on puzzle design like yeah. we only need to bring up the tree mission that could be a second or third cast yeah. but yeah puzzle design has been kind of par and parcel for the adventure game genre for so many years and again just as there's many ways to build an adventure game there are just as many or if not more for puzzle design um you mentioned earlier what was it the uh, samaras uh, the Samus, yes. Yeah, like those kinds of games. And I got, I kind of fail. I only like it was be a few of those without getting a guide. And, or I think it was Machinium or Machinium. Oh, yeah, uh, Machinium. Yeah. Machinium. And yet, like when it comes to puzzle design, that is just a topic, again, like there is so much to, you know, unwrap about it. But uh, there's one question I want to ask you about. And that's with this idea of, I guess, a quote-unquote realistic puzzle versus kind of an in-universe puzzle. And what I mean by that is in some adventure games, we see them trying to make use of real-world logic in them. You know, like you have to understand how, let's say, acids and basics work to maybe melt a lock. Or you have to understand, you know, how to set something on fire. And then there's puzzles that are just completely in universe. Like let's say, I'm trying to think of a good example off the top of my head. Like if we're playing like a fantasy or a sci-fi universe adventure game, and we're making use of uh, magic spells or lasers or anything like that. Yeah. And the question I want to ask you is, like when you're thinking about good puzzle design, do you think the player should, or do you think like real world knowledge? should be a factor when it comes to designing a good puzzle in a game? No, ideally not. Uh, I, I, I have used it on occasion uh, where, you have to, where you have to have real-world knowledge in order to solve the puzzle, but uh, ideally it should be solvable by uh, observing and playing the game. I think it's it's a little bit unfair to to expect the player to pull in uh, knowledge from the outside to solve a puzzle. I used it on uh, there's a puzzle in the Dream Machine in Chapter Two. Uh, this is a slight spoiler. Uh, I use there's a there's a puzzle where you you encounter a, a death statue uh, and you have to put the pieces of his inner ear. Um, yeah. in order to make him here. And uh, there's only three pieces. So you, even if you don't know the order uh, in, in real life, you can, you can end up uh, guessing pretty quickly. But I, I always thought that puzzle was slightly unfair because uh, it required uh, knowledge of the inner ear anatomy. And I, I realized a lot of people don't really have that. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, for myself, like, I am terrible when it comes to any kind of musical-based puzzle or having to, you know, either organize, like, different tones or pitches or things yeah. like that. 
Yeah. And like anytime a game has like a music based puzzle like that, I just can't solve it. I remember a Sanatorium. I think that's what it was called back in the 90s. Oh, I love that game. Yeah. I had to look up that solution because at one pulse you had to match, you had to listen to the tones and, you know, figure out which put them in the right order. And, like, those kinds of puzzles I'm, I just cannot do. Yeah. And, and as you were saying, like, it's always that tricky balance because as a game developer, you're obviously building from your own knowledge pool. But in the same vein, as you say, like not too many people have studied the the inner workings of an ear to know no. how to put a puzzle together like that. No. I, it's I mean uh, it's unf- it's unfair to expect people to have perfect pitch or to know the inner workings of an ear. Um, but also, you uh, if you if you do and if you do base puzzles on hearing perception or color perception i think you it, it's uh, if that's what you want to do uh, you should tread carefully because a lot of people have uh, have uh, pitch pitch perception problems and color perception problems and, and a lot more than you realize i i did an uh, for one of my early games i, I did a color based puzzle and uh, I ended up getting uh, a lot of emails from people uh, which, uh, who had problems with that. And one of the players, he, he, he wrote me a, a very extensive test of the steps he had to go through in order to solve my puzzle. And uh, long story shortened, he had to take a, a, screen, a screenshot for uh, every uh, permutation of the puzzle. And then he had to import them into Photoshop, and uh, with the color p- picker, he could see the hexadecimal color readout, and that's how he ended up solving the puzzle. And uh, reading that, I was so dismayed. So I, 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 I uh, from then on, I, I try to steer clear of color puzzles, or at least uh, offer an alternative solution if you, if you, if you can't perceive colors, which uh, I think one in eight. May uh, no one in twelve uh, men have problems perceiving colors, yeah. which is uh, uh, which is a lot. Yes, yes it is. And yeah, as we were just saying there, like with a lot of these puzzles, like you always have to be aware of that. And yeah. that actually takes me to a very—I'm not sure this considered a controversial, or polarized question for adventure game design, but on the topic of hints or basically allowing the player to skip a puzzle because this is something that again like the adventure game genre as you said earlier like with what people originally thought adventure games were going to be which was again these mind melting puzzles that you would need to be a cryptographer to solve that for a lot of people who play adventure games you run you can often run to that situation where you only have two options look up a hint guide or stop playing the game and we've seen like different takes or different like ideas about trying to get make sure everybody can play through an adventure game. I know I'm not sure if you've heard of this developer, Artifix Mundi. They do a lot. They do kind of like a uh, hidden object slash adventure slash puzzle game. Like it's a very like they they have like their own little spin on that kind of genre. And what they do is that they'll often allow you to skip a puzzle or get like a hint to what the solution is after every so many seconds that you haven't solved it. And I want to ask you again, as a longtime adventure game fan and, and designer, like, what do you think about allowing people to skip a puzzle or even just having an in-game hint system in the game? I, f- I think that's uh, I think that's uh, okay. Uh, I'm fine fine with that. Uh, uh, sometimes I, they're done. The hint systems can be done a little bit clunkily, um, but I, I, f- I think uh, I think if the game uh, registers that uh, the player has f- uh, tried and failed uh, x amount of times, and then the game feeds you a little a little snippet to push you along i think that's totally fair um it is it's uh playing adventure games 
when you're stuck is so painful. Yes. Uh, so if anything can be done to alleviate that, that I think I consider that uh, totally fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, um, again, this is another thing for the fans listening who know this story. Like when I played a uh, miss, I think it was Yuru. It was kind of like their third person take on the genre. Mm. They had a um, external hint site you could go to, and they would just feed you hints of like varying degrees of completeness. And yeah. it was just basically like, okay, I can't solve this puzzle. Give me hint one. Nope, that's not giving me anything. Give me hint two. <laughs> okay, I still don't know. Okay, just just tell me the answer. I, I'm, this is not coming to me here. Yeah, I, f- I think that's a good way to do it to to uh, to to uh, offer it in in tiers like that. And usually, when when people uh, email me for hints. I usually write back with with a question. So, ha- have you noticed that <laughs> the lights in this room are blinking? And if they if they write back no, uh, but I need more help, then another question comes. Have Have you counted? <laughs> have you tried to count the the number of blinks? I mean, that, and and to do it like that instead of just spelling out the answers. Yeah, you, you I. I want the player to 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 think and to be engaged, and that's that's why I design these puzzles. So just spelling out the answer was, would be counter counterproductive. But if if I can give them a hint that kind of sets them down the right path of the uh, the right train of, of thought, then uh, that's totally fair. I, I I actually quite appreciate those type of hint systems myself. Yeah. And with puzzle design, I remember I spoke with uh, Ron Gilbert about this. Like he talked mm-hmm. about that kind of philosophy of a lock and key of designing a puzzle and kind of using puzzle dependency charts when it comes to trying to like build a puzzle yourself. So I definitely want to ask you. I think this will probably be our segue into talking more about the Dream Machine. But mm-hmm. again, with the six ep- or is the six chapters and the seven years of development, like what was your philosophy? when it came to puzzle design. Because again, we mentioned a few minutes ago the inner ear puzzle. And for people who play the game, I guess we're... I For this point, I guess for people listening to us, we're officially going to be getting into spoiler territory now. But over the course of the six chapters, there is a huge variety in terms of puzzles and situations in the game. Yeah, I, f- I think um, my, f- my, my game design philosophy... Um, veered more and more into looking for opportunities to to put a puzzle in the game where it didn't feel forced. I think I, I, when I started out, I had ideas for this is a neat puzzle, uh, and I and I would try to look for a place to to put it. Um, but I think uh, over the course of the game, I would start approaching it from the opposite side, where where uh, this is this is the game, and uh, and uh, this is a, a good point in the story where I could present the puzzle, and this is a good location to do it. And I would start more looking for opportunities to uh, to to put puzzles in the game instead of uh, imposing them on the game. Like putting like making the puzzles feel like they're in universe; they're not just like padding things out. Yeah. That is a very tough uh, hurdle to clear there for a lot of these games. Because, again, like I'm sure you can think of examples just as well as I can of like games where it feels like the puzzles just feel like they're just like giant walls that come. Like, I just want to go get, I don't know, it's like, I just want to go get something to eat. But wait, the door is locked. I need to go find a key. But then the refrigerator isn't working. I need to solve that. Like, yeah. And again, like, as you said, like, with your first game being just focused more on puzzles, like when you're playing just a puzzle game, yes, you are expect like every room to be a puzzle. But when you're trying to combine a story or a narrative to that, like how do you decide like where and when should a player be hit by a puzzle? Uh, that's a that's that's a great question. Uh, I think. I think it's it's if if you if you if you are if you are gonna design an adventure game puzzle uh, game, I think it's a pretty good idea to 
to to to do a, a sketch of every environment and um, don't worry about the puzzles and do all the uh, sketch versions of all the cutscenes and and put put all the little stick figure versions of of your characters in the game and then for the second pass of, of the game uh, start to look for opportunities where you could actually meaningfully insert uh, small puzzles into the game I think that's a that way you'll end up with puzzles that feels uh, less uh, artificially uh, imposed. Mm -hmm. But it is, uh, I think, uh, a, a good puzzle, the, the, a good puzzle can be so many things. It, it can yes. tell the story of the game. It can provide detail and atmosphere of, of the world you're trying to, to build and convey. It can reveal character. Um, it can also just seem totally unrelated to anything going on in the game, and, and that that's what you don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you can, if you can, uh, if 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 obviously it's the the classic is a key and a locked door, um, which I I don't really consider that to be a puzzle really, because. I think there needs to be a little twist in order to call that a puzzle. That would a key in a locked door is more of an obstacle. A, a, yeah. a puzzle is something where uh, you have to expend a, a little bit of brain power in order to solve it, and, and using a key in a door uh, doesn't meet that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I guess uh, expanding on that, I, this is another question. I'm sure you've thought long and hard about when developing the Dream Machine. What do you consider to be, I guess, too hard of a puzzle? Like, when does it get, like, so frustrating that people can't solve it? Because um, we've been talking a lot on a lot of these podcasts and our live discussions about kind of the new player's experience or, you know, the player's perspective. And just as you can't really rely on you know everybody's internal knowledge to be the same you can't also rely on everybody's skill to be the same because i've spoken to people and like for myself there are some puzzles that i can solve very easily that i'm sure somebody else is going to struggle with just as again vice versa there are puzzles that i take a long time to figure out that i'm sure somebody can figure out within like five to ten seconds of looking at it yeah, and I think the only solution to that problem is to be very careful about what type of feedback you provide when the player fails on a puzzle. Um, that and that's I think I think ninety percent of the of, of puzzle design is um, judging uh, uh, how to convey feedback for a player that has failed solving a puzzle. And you, you, because you, obviously you don't want to give obvious feedback because then the puzzle will feel uh, simple and patronizing, and you, it can't be obtuse and and um, and uh, unintelligible, because then the the player w once they fail um, they don't have any new information to go on, uh, so they end up trying you know, the same or similar solutions over and over again, and that's, that, that'll just lead to, to frustration. Or the uh, key change we were talking about earlier, that oh, was going to yes. take A and B, A and C, yes. B and yes. C, and so on. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, it's so disheartening. If you design a puzzle game uh, and you, you, you invite a play tester, and I usually have a kind of a no no talk policy I, I sit behind them quietly <laughs> watching them <laughs> uh and um and, 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 and it's it's so hard when i see a player get stuck and they start key chaining the inventory objects or they start to walk around um they, they cycle through the environment room by room by room yeah. uh, over and over and over again and they keep missing this little I've, small yeah. cabinet that I, I thought was super <laughs> obvious. <laughs> and for people uh, listening, I've never done that in an adventure oh, game. That's never oh, happened to me. <laughs> oh, we, we've all been there. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's no fun. It, that's really where adventure games break down. I, as much as I love them, reaching that, that moment where, where I realized that uh, 
I'm I'm somebody thought this was obvious, but I'm just not seeing it. Uh, yeah. That's that's not fun. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, sitting behind, uh, sitting, uh, play testing obviously is is the best way to solve this. Uh, once you see a player struggle on a puzzle like that for about half an hour, then you sure will go in and fix that problem. Uh, mm-hmm. Quick li- lickety split. Yeah. And, like, with these kinds of puzzles, I guess, a question, like, here's another one, I guess, just for, like, your kind of play style. Are there any puzzle types or solutions to puzzles that you have trouble solving? Like I said earlier, like, my uh, tone-based ones. Like, do you have any on your end? Um, that, that's a good question. I think, yeah, well, I think so, some game developers uh, rely they they try to make a puzzle harder by uh, making the solution sequence play fast. So it, it, it's a it's a light that blinks in five colors, and they make uh, it blink super fast. And uh, I, I have a hard says time with kind of puzzles. Simon Says type puzzles. That uh, yes. It's a sequence with the red, red, green, blue, yellow, but it blinks so fast that you 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 don't have any chance perceiving it. And that, uh, obviously, that a lot of people have problems with that, but uh, and it's not super fun either. It's it's a little bit unfair. Mm-hmm. But anything requiring timing in adventure games is a is a sensitive topic. Oh, any yes. any little mini game that that is artificially inflated, inserted into an adventure game, where all of a sudden you, you like uh, Rise of the Dragon, the, the old oh, it's a really old game. Um, it's an adventure game. Very atmospheric and moody, and at least on three occasions, they insert these weird little shooting side side scrolling shooting games <laughs> that don't really fit the the the, the, the game at all. And that that's also really really odd. Yeah, I always fail at those little games. <laughs> yeah, and again, with a lot of the puzzles like being designed like that, uh, it's very hard to know just again, like, how much you want to design into these games, and especially with the Dream Machine, uh, Dream Machine being split into six different chapters. And this was one of the things I definitely want to ask you about, Anders, because the whole idea of episodic design and episodic storytelling, that kind of, like, hit its, like, fever pitch again back during the last decade. Again, Telltale did it. Uh, there was a, a Sin game. It was, like, a first-person shooter that they got as far as, like, one chapter in. Yes. With developing the Dream Machine, did you guys originally intend it to be a episodic game, or was it originally going to be like just one game kind of thing? Uh, we were going for one game, uh, but we quickly realized that the ambition of the game outpaced uh, the budget, so we we ended up breaking it up, um, which is uh, it's it's a it's a mixed blessing. I, I would definitely. Not rec- if anybody is listening to this, considering breaking up their game into six chapters, I'd, uh, I'd, six releases, I, I'd say don't do that. Uh, it's horrible. Uh, break it up into two releases if you have to. No more than that, um, because um, it's uh, it's very hard to. I mean, it, it's very hard to to stay motivated over the course of of a ten year development cycle. But it's also very hard to motivate people to get excited for chapter three or chapter four because then they they know that you're still very far from complete. So you end up uh, writing uh, journalists who say, "Yeah, this sounds great, but call me back when <laughs> when you're done," and that's very disheartening. Um, you, you get a lot of attention in the beginning and a lot of attention in the end, yep. but in the middle, you're going to be struggling for sure. Yeah. And I heard similar things when I spoke with uh, uh, Dave Gilbert. I always get the two Gilberts confused. Uh, oh, yeah. Dave Gilbert from Watchai, when he, the original, the Blackwell series, that was like the first one he made. That was split, I think, five or six episodes as well. And he said something very similar that, again, that it was originally done for budget and just uh, production limitations yeah. and yeah, it is a lot harder when you're trying to develop a game like that you know trying to figure out 
you know, what do I include in this chapter? What do I save for the next one? And as you just said, the marketing is another very big point. You know, is somebody going to want to cover the fourth of like an eight part of your game? Or are they yeah. just going to wait until the very end and try and give it coverage? Yeah, that and to and to be honest, I ideally I I, I want the players to play the full game and uh, f- chapter one through six. I I I really hate that we were so slow with the with the release uh, schedule that it was about a year in between chapters. So a lot of people had to wait. They played played a chapter. And they, uh, and then they had to wait a year and try to remember the story. And I, 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 re- I really, uh, I, I obviously don't. That's not optimal. Um, but we had to do it the same as uh, as the the what you die game. We had to do it for for boring body terror reasons. And with, uh, I know there's a big gap. I think between chapter five and chapter six, if I remember right, the dream. Yeah. Game. Yeah, chapter six was very hard to do. Um, it's um, uh, just developing the, the look of, of those environments uh, was extremely hard. Um, we u- we utilized uh, a lot of ultraviolet lights for those environments to, to make to, to to kind of harken back to the uh, trippy psychedelia of uh, of the sixties. And uh, turns out you can't really work in ultraviolet lights for extended periods of time before you get a headache. <laughs> mm. And you can't really not work in ultraviolet lights because then you don't see the colors at all. So that was a very tricky problem that, that, uh, that Eric had to, to go through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... Like with like with chapter six in particular, and again for people listening to us, we are in kind of spoiler territory, quote unquote spoiler territory yeah. right now. This is the one that pretty much takes place almost, I think, exclusively in the dream state. So yes. this is when things get, as you said, like they're most abstract and surreal. Yeah, it's uh, f- full spoiler. It it uh, takes place in the dream of your unborn child. And I was, that was one of the, that was one of the um, ideas, the the foundational ideas for the game that uh, I wanted to make a game about dreams. And then, and I found out that um, unborn children uh, have uh, REM sleep. You can actually see their eyes, their little eyes darting back and forth as, as you do during REM sleep. So I was always so fascinated by that. What, what does an unborn baby dream about? Because they, they, don't, they haven't been born. They don't have any conception of anything, basically. So, so what would an unborn child dream look like? And that, that I'm trying to explore that in, in Chapter 6. And obviously it gets very abstract and trippy. Yeah. And like with like the growth of the Dream Machine over the six chapters, I guess. In, now, obviously, from a story perspective, the game grows along those lines. But from like a, I guess, a puzzle philosophy standpoint, like, did you find like your own style or your own kind of design of the gameplay like evolve from chapters one through six? Yeah, I think so. I, uh, I, I definitely. When I when I look back on it, I, I definitely feel that my confidence as a game designer grew over the course of, of developing this game. Uh, the, it's the, the first chapter is, 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 is a pretty traditional adventure game um, fair with, with hints of, a, of, 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 of trippy darkness. And then over the course of the next five chapters, I've, I think you, you can actually feel that both Eric and, and, and my confidence grew, grew a lot. We took a lot more chances. Uh, with the with the look and the and the content of the game, I, I don't. I, I never would have uh, tried anything like um, what you what you experience towards the the end of the game, where you, uh, yeah, full, yeah, I guess full spoiler, where, where you walk into your mother's vagina and um, uh, perform an abortion on a fetus version of yourself. That I would never dare attempt something, pull a scene like that yeah. off. 
And I know Chapter 6 was, like, looking at some of the Steam reviews before I started uh, the cast today, I know Chapter 6 was very polarizing in terms of kind of the content that was in it. Because, again, like, this is where I think Dream Machine gets its most abstract, and probably, I think, for a lot of people, maybe it's most disturbing in terms of what's going on and what's being depicted. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is... It is disturbing. It, it's just, uh, especially, especially when you reach the, the, the UV landscape and you see, um, and you encounter copies of yourself in, at, at various ages. And they're all snooty and snippy and have their own agenda. And they're, they kind of exaggerate, extent, exaggerated versions of, of, of the player character. It's a, uh, it's a, it's such a weird things to be, um, to be exposed to. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised that it's divisive. Um, because it's very far, far removed from, from the, the lighthearted comedy of, of, of a lot of uh, adventure games where you, you have the comedy sidekick who's, who's a little bit, who, who's uh, throwing one-liners at you. It's, it's the opposite of that. It's, it's, it, it's uh, seeing, encountering yourself as a space baby type of weird uh, at, at the end of 2001. That's more where we, where we were heading with Chapter 6. Mm-hmm. Now, with like the story of the Dream Machine, again, with the game being split into six different chapters, and as you said a few minutes ago, it kind of being inspired by learning that babies have REM sleep. Did you have kind of the overall plot of the game kind of figure out from the beginning, or did it kind of grow and iterate or get become iterated on over the course of development? Um, it, 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 the structure was in place from the beginning. I, uh, I, I looked a lot at the, the way Zelda games are structured, where you, you start in in the Hyrule world and then you uh, you try to enter a temple and then you enter a temple solve the the puzzle the, the beat the boss and then you exit out into Hyrule world again and I, I thought it would be interesting to do uh, to have a similar structure um, but instead of Hyrule you have this apartment complex and instead of temples, you have to gain access to people's dreams and and solve so solve the dream or address whatever uh, problem the pe- the person is dreaming about. And then once you've done that, then you exit the dream and go back to the apartment complex again. So it's a, it's a, the structure of the game was always a very much a Zelda game, and the st- the story falls along those beats very closely but I, I knew i wanted the unborn baby dream in there and i knew i wanted to um to explore what what your significant other uh, to 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 delve into the dream of your wife i thought would be very interesting what what if you had the opportunity to enter your significant other's dream would you actually do it? Would would it would it be a good idea to do it, or would it uh, change your relationship beyond repair? And one thing that I have to ask, like, well, we have like a kind of like these questions here about the dream machine. Like, how long did it take? I guess Eric to design some of like these environments. Like, like was there like an average time, or did it depend based on like what like the chapter demanded? Um. I, I don't know about an average time. Some of them, obviously, they're they're, they're very different uh, yes. in the in the detailing, but uh, Eric works uh, very. He's very fast, uh, so so he he definitely have a, a rough version done within a within a, a week, mm-hmm. and then we'd go back and forth about the the details, mm-hmm. the lighting and uh, what what props. To, to put there, but uh, working in clay and cardboard, uh, do, doing a, a rough version of the room is very fast. You just you, you cut cardboard and, and you, you place the walls and, and you kind of yeah this uh, this room looks about right, and then you drill down into the medium uh, size 
furniture, things like furniture, the furniture placement, and then you go a, a step further uh, with the, the detailing of the small props and where to put those. And that that takes uh, the small props takes a long time. And I guess that like uh, building on that, like in terms of designing the dream machine, like like was like the process kind of you guys coming up with like what the puzzle or the environment was going to be like discussing it and then doing the mock-up or did you kind of like do like a mock-up first and then kind of think okay how can we fit like a puzzle or design the story around this specific setting or this specific design yeah i usually did a little a little crude pencil sketch of of what i wanted the the the, the basics of the room to look like and uh, and then uh, sometimes I had a, f- a full-fledged idea for a puzzle, and sometimes I just had a, an inkling that that this is a good opportunity to to have a, a puzzle. But I don't know exactly the details of the puzzle yet. That it'll, I uh, hoping it'll, it it would come to me. Um, so that that's usually how it worked, and and sometimes that worked out, and sometimes we had to uh, to to cut things because uh, it turned out it wasn't a good opportunity, but. Uh, we we kept it pretty 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 organic, pretty fluid. Um, I'm trying to think of some other some questions for you. Like yep. again, like with the development of like with each one of these situations, I guess here's one. Like one thing that was very interesting as you got further into development, I guess going back to what you were saying with regards to like, becoming more confident, is kind of like the space of where puzzles will take place in. And what I mean by that is we've seen some adventure games go for kind of one room, it's completely encapsulated, you know, the solutions in that room, the puzzles in that room, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then you have puzzles that are built around multiple environments, or as we were saying earlier, going back and forth between them. And yeah. I think if I, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this one, I think chapter four, was the one that kind of involved you going between I think like two or three different dreams, or I think the dream I think it was like two dreams separated by something like that. Yeah, it uh, it's chapter five. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, that was also one of those uh, foundational ideas that um, uh, we in the in the in the in, in the game the dream machine. Uh, one of the foundational concepts of that game came from came from the the the, the psychonaut uh, slash dolphin researcher John C. Lilly. Mm-hmm. He he had this uh, beautiful notion that when he, he was he was uh, experimenting with uh, drugs, uh, ketamine. Uh, mainly uh, and uh, LSD and and he had this notion that when he was tripping he would visit a, a parallel reality <laughs> he he would act, go to a parallel reality and uh, so when he came he when he sobered up he would have a little pad and, and paper next to his uh, bed and he would draw whatever he saw so if he saw a, a landmark or a coastline or um, something uh, sig- significant. He would he would uh, take notes of that, mm-hmm. and he would encourage friends of his that that were that had a similar um, inclination to do the same. And then um, the the idea was that they would gather all their notes and and piece them together and splice together, and, and together they would chart out a map of the collective. <laughs> Uh, she, the, she, collective unconscious, uh, because you know, if if you saw a pyramid and I saw a pyramid, then clearly we were at the same place. So, but yeah, obviously, the, they didn't get very far with that idea. But I thought the notion was so fun that you know, we <laughs> that I thought uh, that that's a great base for a computer game. And and in the the game, the Dream Machine, we treat dreams uh in this in a similar way we, we treat dreams as a as a collective shared experience a, 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 an alternative reality that we all visit when we go to bed and so uh one, so obviously one of the one of the ways we could explore that idea was to go from one dreamer's dream to another with still within the, still within dreams so we uh, that's that's what chapter five is all about mm-hmm. 
And yeah, like, like I was saying a few minutes ago, but people listening, we're getting into some major spoilers. Yeah, here, that, but... that is a that is a big spoiler. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything. I definitely want to touch on a few of the story beats of the game, and that's going to be 100 percent spoilers. I guess uh, before we move on, I have one final like puzzle related question for you, Anders. But mm-hmm. I guess for you, like, are there any other topics regarding the puzzle design that we didn't touch on? Um. Oh, this so this so yeah. so puzzle design is a huge topic. I, mm-hmm. uh, nothing, nothing, nothing comes comes to mind. But yeah, pu- puzzles is is just something mm-hmm. that's uh, it's it's so it's so much fun, but it's so hard to to pull off. And keeping with that, that takes me to the question I wanted to ask you. Like, over the course, obviously, over the course of developing the Dream Machine, you design a lot of puzzles. I actually thought of another yeah. question while I was discussing this. Uh, I'll get to that one first. Were there any puzzles that you designed for the Dream Machine that kind of were left on the cutting room floor, that like you just could not fit them into the game? Yeah, there was a, there was a lot. I, uh, I don't have any concrete uh, examples of puzzles that I that I cut uh maybe maybe some will spring to mind but y- usually you have a you have a, a good idea for a puzzle you think and then and then you sit down and try to to break it up into digestible pieces for a player and, and you realize that in, in order to solve this puzzle the player has to realize this go do this and then do that and then realize this and and sometimes you just end up with it with a puzzle chain, a, a solution chain that's just uh, that that is impossible to communicate to a player, and probably impossible to uh, to to realize for a player as well. So you end up you end up simplifying puzzles a lot um, because you just realize that that going through all these steps isn't a lot of fun. And it's, and a lot of times the player is ahead of the curb, and you, the, you you don't want to go through the minutia of solving a puzzle, because if you if you know how to how to solve it, you 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 want to execute that solution as quickly as possible, and you don't want to run around um, uh, dealing with uh, s- s- small buttons or whatever the puzzle requires you to do. Uh, so you end up simplifying puzzles a lot. Uh, which I, which is always a good thing, but it, yeah, a lot got cut, uh, not not as much as 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 you'd expect. It, it a lot of it found its way into into other chapters along the okay. along the course of of such a long development time. That's one of the luxuries you have. You can take uh, cut ideas and uh, find another home for them further down the line. All right, and I guess with that. Were there any puzzles that you developed with the Dream Machine that particularly stood out as some of like your favorites when you were design when after you finished designing them? Um, I like the size changing puzzles in Chapter Five a lot. I, I think we got quite a quite a lot of mileage out of the fact that the player can be three different sizes uh, over the course of, of Chapter Chapter Five. And I, yeah, I also. Um, yeah, I also like the moment where where you go from one dreamer's dream to to the other. Uh, that always that that's that's such a fun, delightful surprise to the player that 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 the game allows that, and that that you can you can uh, take items you find in one dreamer's dream and and utilize <laughs> them in in the other dream. And I remember, like, for myself, like, Chapter 6 again was definitely where, uh, from a pole design, things got very trippy. I remember the map, or, like, having to put, like, the different photos up on the frame, which would then change the world around you. And I think you were kind of, there was one part you were kind of, like, stuck in, like, that kind of, like, purgatory state. And I forget if I either looked up a solution to that, or I may have just, like, somehow brute forced that one, when you kind of got, like, lost in that, with all the different victors. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's tricky. I, uh, I I noticed playtesters were having a, a problem solving that puzzle, and and my solution to that is that you can, uh, since you have access to all the dreams um, in the in chapter six, you can you can you can go, 
you can go back and visit all the dreams in the game. Then uh, I, I use that as an opportunity to insert uh, little hints. So, so if you go back to a totally unrelated dream and talk to to just some random character that <laughs> that that you've already um, spent a lot of time with, if you if you go back and talk to them and uh, you can actually explain. You know, I'm I'm facing this puzzle um, <laughs> and I have no idea what to do. And they will they will try to offer a little a little uh, snippets of advice to you. And some some is useful and some some is some is op- the opposite of useful. But I, I I thought that was a pretty fun way to to make um, make them to pull them put them back on the on the scene again, mm-hmm. having that you can have little conversations with them but yeah it is it's it's uh it's the last puzzle is it's so fast yes it it's it's pulling uh, it's pulling the de- small details from the entire game into one puzzle one big hopefully satisfying puzzle but yeah it is it is very hard to solve Mm-hmm. I yeah, not too hard. I I hope, but yeah, you you had to uh, look at a walkthrough, right? I think so for that one. Yeah, uh, then yeah, it might be too hard. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's so hard to gauge difficulty. Like you say, so some people uh, would probably find it easy. Some some people uh, found it very very hard. Uh, you just never know. Yeah, and again, like. When we got to chapter six, when more of the dream logic kind of took center stage, at that point, like, there is no real world analog that you can really use when it comes to trying to solve these puzzles. No, 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 not at all. I mean, <laughs> time doesn't work the way we expect, and uh, the, the, the geography doesn't work the way we expect. It, it's, uh, it's all out the window by the, by the last chapter. But yeah, I, I wanted. Yeah, it, it's. Um, I didn't want it to feel like a, an adventure game maze. So, uh, sometimes adventure games um, pad, they used to pad the playtime by putting a, an arbitrary maze in them. <laughs> uh, in the uh, Indiana Jones uh, and the Holy Grail comes to mind, it, and Loom as well. Uh, I think I, I listened to uh, Making of by Brian Moriarty. And and he said that that some management type at LucasArts said that you have to pad the playtime. This game is too short, <laughs> so so they solved that by putting in these arbitrary mazes that are that they're not they're not great. Mm. Uh, I love Loom and uh, Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail, but the maze puzzles aren't fun at all. And I didn't want to. I, I didn't want. The, the last chapter to feel like that it still has a some kind of weird logic to it the, the way you move through these environments and, and the more map pieces you find the more you can actually change the way it's stitched together but you only realize that when you close to the solution but uh, yeah I, I hope it didn't come off as as, as maze like and it's been a while I can't really remember that far but no yeah, again, like with these kinds of puzzles, especially with the course of evolving over the six chapters, there's just so much you could really draw from when you get to that final one. And to remember some other examples of puzzle design, I think in like either the first or second chapter, I think there was a puzzle involving like organizing books on a bookshelf or something like that. Yeah. I think I also got a little bit of trouble with, but I don't remember if I actually needed a guide for that one. Yeah, it's it's tricky, and it, it it's it's um, first of all, we basically stole that puzzle from Cruise for a Corpse, the old Des- Delphin Software um, sailing game. Mm-hmm. They have a bookshelf where you organize books uh, in order to unlock a, a secret door. Uh, but in our game, you. Uh, you have six diaries with these uh, uh, diary entry, entries that are procedurally generated, with, and they're kind of gibberishy. 
and I, I hope I hope you you that the player gets that pretty pretty soon that they it's not meaningful text it's it just the same text jumbled uh, and the key, the key thing about it is these certain keywords in what order they 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 show up um, I think yeah I think one of the latest tweaks I did to the game was to capitalize these keywords to make them stand out a little bit more because I've yeah I found out through place testing that some players were actually reading these diary entries and uh, for a long time and that that was the opposite of what what I wanted I guess one final question and I'm not sure this will be too much of a tangent but did you do like any research or like look anything up about like dreams or the study of sleep when you were making the dream machine yeah as much as I could it's a yeah um it's my as much as i could it, it's a fascinating topic and i've always been um fascinated by by dreams and um, mm-hmm. what purpose they serve uh i haven't read the the book why we sleep that just came out uh yet but i've ordered it on uh, on amazon okay but it's 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 been really good i look forward to that I could certainly have a discussion about dreams. Like I have weird dreams myself. Like that could be yep. an entire podcast in of itself there. Yeah. <laughs> but again, we could sit here and chat all day long, I feel. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I definitely want to talk about what's next for you guys. As we said earlier, the Dream Machine wrapped up with Chapter 6. That was in 2017. And we haven't heard too much from you. So I guess... For any fans listening, I guess what are you guys working on next? Uh, we after the wrap of the Dream Machine, we started up quite a few different projects, and most of them are still in pre-production right now. But uh, as far as games go, uh, I I wanted to do a little um, a little uh, adventure game slash puzzle follow-up to that to the old gateway games mm-hmm. so i started doing uh, uh, I, i've done two gateway games in the past and i thought uh, it would be fun to 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 do another one and uh, round out a little trilogy of gateway games so that's what i've been doing uh, lately uh, and it's gone really well i'm i'm in the play testing tweaking uh, stage right now so it's it's come quite far, I'd, I'd say. Okay. And I gotta ask: Are you guys going to continue doing like the stop motion or hand construction aesthetic, or will you continue with that with whatever your next project will be? Uh, I think uh, the, the the project will decide okay. what it wants to be. Um, uh, for a long while after finishing the Dream Machine, I I I, I didn't really I, I couldn't imagine myself doing another stop motion adventure game but uh with with the passage of time i've i've i've, I've sweetened a little bit to the idea but it, it won't be of the scope of the dream machine because the dream machine is, is crazy crazy big for two yes. people to pull off uh, but yeah maybe something small or w- would be fun to revisit uh it's it was so much fun to to uh, tinker with these little uh, clay worlds and, and and imagine what what could happen in them, I I really had such a blast uh, doing that. So maybe maybe at a future date, who knows? Mm-hmm. I, it actually takes me to I think my final question is we go into wrap things up with. Mm-hmm. Um, out of all the sets that you and Eric worked on for the Dream Machine, like what is like the one like what's your favorite like environment for the game? Mm-hmm. I'm really fond of um, the greenhouse, the weird cactus greenhouse in uh, in uh, the landlord's hidden secret bath- back uh, back back uh, room. I don't, I don't really know why, but the I, I like the layout of the room, and I, I like the freedom you have as a player in that room. You get to 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 to. Um, play with all these uh, his little tools uh and and it also uh tells so much of about him as a as a character that he's he has this little cactus garden uh, that he's been growing for 
for so long uh, for for really weird purposes. Um, I like that a lot. There's so many, so many beautiful and and obviously the forest locations in chapter five, where you walk around in this little oh. fairy tale uh, town with uh, uh, fairy tale characters who've had their organs stolen from them in the in the middle of the night. I really like that as well. It, it has the, the this the 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 sweetness of a, of a fairy tale combined with uh, the, the horrific, horrific horrific notion of of having your organs stolen, mm-hmm. which which was a, a notion that actually came from a dream I had, mm-hmm. where where uh, I walked around in a fairy tale and encountered uh, fairy tale creatures who'd been maimed in. in and I, I remember, uh, which which was horrific, but uh, I remember when I talked to them in my dream, they still had that kind of. They were talking in that peppy fairy tale voice. That yeah, this happened to me. Is isn't that a shame? I'll be late for work for sure now. It, it, that and that was how they talked. And I, that was so uh, really enticing. So I, I I turned that into one of the dreams. <laughs> Oh man, I could see this cast running like an extra an hour or two as we just like compare weird dreams we've had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess like for me, like the environments that I remember, like from chapter five, like as you said, the forest is a good one. I liked like that kind of like infinite hallway, of, like where where you could like grow like the three different sizes, and yep. like that one spot where you see like the connection between the two dreams. You kind of like saw how stuff from the uh, hallway kind of like dystopian dream was leaking into the forest dream and vice versa. I thought that always stood out. And I remember, I think it was either chapter three or chapter four when you're on uh, your wife's like kind of cruise, like the ocean liner. Oh yeah. And like that final scene when you get inside like the captain's room, it's just like a, like a mountain of victor corpses or st- like that thing that always like yeah like, really like really like just stood out there yeah that that's uh yeah that that's that's quite that's quite an image uh you you're in this um boiler room mm-hmm. um in the middle of a pile of ver- dead versions of yourself it, it's it's a very bleak uh, image <laughs> but um Strangely fun as well. And speaking about Victor, one thing that I didn't touch on, I was just thinking about, like, how long did, like, Eric and you, like, spend on kind of designing Victor's model, like, in terms of, like, what you wanted him to look like? It was a pretty fast process. I think Eric did uh, maybe three versions of him that... Uh, they were heading in a in a in a certain direction, but they were very abstract. That I think uh, for some reason we had a we had a notion that every character would have a mask in the game. Uh, I don't I can't remember why we decided that, but it, maybe to you know to save lip sync animation or something like that. Every character would wear a mask and. And our idea was to to never explain the the rationale behind that. It, it was. It was we, we just assume that if we don't explain it, the, the player would will just uh, uh, take that as uh, this is how this world works. Everybody wears a mask. Okay, let's <laughs> get on with it. But then we invited playtesters. Every single one immediately wanted to know what's up with the masks, and they couldn't they couldn't get past that. So we we he ended up doing uh, the final version of the game, but I think that uh, the final wor- version of uh, Victor, which ended up in the game, and I think that was version number three, mm-hmm. uh, more or less exactly as he he did. It. So it not 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 a whole lot of versions, uh, I've, uh, and I remember uh, pretty early on we decided to to make the characters with these uh, um, geometric primitives so they their their arms and legs are very square and boxy and victor's head is is an uh, is a is a triangle uh, which, which for some reason felt uh, right for for his character um i guess again like we could just like keep talking all matter a little detail of the dream machine it's such a fascinating yeah. game and 
again, as I said at the start, I always love, like, these kinds of unique aesthetics, and especially, like, stop motion, like, that kind of handcrafted feel to it. I'm trying to think if there's anything, like, big I want to talk about. Again, like, outside of just, like, asking a bunch of, like, random little questions, I think I'm just about a big topic. Like, is, is there anything, like, regarding the Dream Machine or Adventure Design or even just the aesthetic of the game that we didn't touch on that you'd like to bring up? Um, um, yeah, yeah, maybe some of the source material is, is, is fascinating when we, when we're discussing how the look of the game and the feel of the game, we looked a lot at, uh, obviously, uh, Eastern European stop motion animation, uh, especially on Swankmeyer. But we also looked a lot at the movies of Roman Polanski. He, he made a, a an apartment trilogy, which is uh, Rosemary's Baby, The Tenant, okay. and uh, the last one is called Repulsion. But the uh, the movie called The Tenant is is uh, we we based a lot of the the imagery from there. It it has this wonderful parisian um, apartment complex which is dank and moldy and, and horrible uh so we, we we looked a lot at, at how he achieved um it, it, it's when you watch that movie you can all you can almost smell the, the, the mold and the dankness of of the apartments he he, he he visits uh so we looked a lot at how he achieved that for the look of the game and again like the aesthetic is just fascinating i know um was it studio like that does a lot of stop motion and that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, they did Coraline yep. and, and uh, the, uh, the Two Swords uh, movie, martial arts movie, yeah. and they just released uh, another one that I I can't remember the name of, but it looks fascinating as well. Yeah, they're they're, they're crazy. Stop motion today is 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 in a weird realm. It's it's almost. Um, a marriage between stop motion and 3d animation because they, they, they animate these they model these characters uh, in 3d programs and they animate lip sync and everything, um, in a 3d package. And then they, they, um, they, it's 3d print, the, the heads, the mouth shapes and everything and attach it to the puppets. So it's, it's this, uh, I mean, stop motion to begin with is is a pretty absurd medium. It's a very long, it's a very long way to go it, in order to make a movie. But they they found a way to actually make that road even longer. Uh, so and uh, I have knowing you know because I've because I've uh, delved uh, into the fascinating world of stop motion mm-hmm. myself. I know. I know how time consuming and hard that yes. is. So I, I give them my full props. <laughs> oh, yeah. And again, like we've spent, I think so little, this guy's actually talking about the stop motion animation. I mean, that's another, I think hour or two hours easily. I yeah. mean, if you and Eric or any combination are free in the future, I would love to talk more about that. Like on its own separate cast. Cause there's just so much that goes into it. And I'm sure as you're I'm sure you would agree that most people don't even consider when they think about like animating and building these kinds of games or yeah. even just like movies as well. Yeah, it's it's fun when you when you when you tell people how how, how the sausage is made. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you 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 build a, a an or a metal skeleton for the for the character and then you you you, you put a, a you, you you bulk him out a little bit and, and and dress him, and then you have to move him, tiny a little bit, and then step away, take take a picture, and then you go back and move him a tiny little bit, step away, take a picture. That that's how you do it. And uh, a lot of times you just see people's face. Yes, <laughs> they they just, it just contorts <laughs> as the they're trying to seeps the in. horror, the the reality of 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 the of stop motion animation. Uh, become becomes fully aware for them. Uh, it's it's always so fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, obviously you have to be some kind of crazy person to. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, with the description, the horrors of stop motion. I think that is the perfect uh, uh, rapper for the yeah, podcast. Yeah, I think so too. 
But yeah. I guess uh, my final question for you for right now then is, do you have anything you'd like to say to the fans or any final thoughts to end the cast on? Oh, that's a predictable plug, but uh, check out the Gateway Trilogy. Uh, it's the game I'm working on right now. Uh, I don't have a release date yet, but it's coming along uh, very, very, very well. So it'll be it'll be done um this year for sure and i'll have a i'll I'll release a trailer with a date uh in in not too much time all right and again there's just so much we could easily segue into but i'm sure if we're not too careful the audience will go to sleep and then they'll have weird dreams about this cast or maybe Uh, they're sleeping right now and their our voices are helping them (laughs) have a little crazy dream that's my ambition for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Anders, it was a pleasure talking with you. And, yeah, let's uh, hopefully not uh, lose touch again. We'll have you and maybe even Eric on for a future one. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. No problem. It was great talking uh, with talking to you about the Dream Machine. And, yeah, like, I really enjoyed it, not only from the aesthetic standpoint, but – from just the general gameplay and those just very trippy puzzles, even if I did get stuck on a few of them from time to time. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you so much. No problem. So uh, with that said, uh, before I do my uh, end of podcast like wrap up, for people listening, if they want to follow you or Eric or just uh, the company itself, do you have any social media you would like to plug? Yeah, we have the, the Dream Game on Twitter. Huh? that's a good good way to find us alright so with that said for those of you listening we're going to end the cast here thank you so much for tuning in be sure to check out the YouTube channel if you're watching this on either the Game Wisdom site or on iTunes and check out our Patreon patreon.com slash if you like to support the channel and what I do and all that but if you are a developer working on your own game and you'd like to come on please don't hesitate to get in touch we're always looking for new voices for it. But with that said, we're going to end the cast here. So once again, thank you for tuning into the Perceptive Podcast, where we examine the art and science of games. And we'll be back real soon with another great discussion. But until then, take care. If you're looking for a book on design, my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, is out now. It is available where most books are sold, and it comes in paper, hardcover, or digital copies. This is the perfect book for anyone interested in learning about game design, whether you are a student, enthusiast, or just a fan. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design, and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it, and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.